this is probably not the best thing to do while under the influence of diazepam. Um, so I work better with an editor when I'm doing a podcast like that being said or thus. Uh, I tend to benefit from somebody like ALT or Scott to keep me on, on track and keep me focused so that, you know, I, I'm not going off uh, derailing things and talking about unrelated stuff and instead I am actually getting to the point and, and delivering the information I need to deliver and doing it all in timely fashion so the podcasts you know can meet their divorce lines and be less than the length of one of my videos which is you know it's fine I, I need that you know the, the reason my videos are so long is because I want to include as, like, as much information as possible when I'm talking about something and you know it, it sort of gives me a bit of anxiety when I'm talking about something and, and I can't mention, you know, something related to it that I wanted to because we have to move on. And that being said, it's not really a big issue because it's, you know, if it's related to Phil, I'll probably bring it up again at some point in the future. There'll be opportunities to take the piss out of him like within the next few days anyway. So, you know, it's never a big deal. But um, on thus, because we're normally talking about a specific topic for that um, particular stream and then we move on, um, some of the work, some of the notes that I take don't get used. And again, uh, I, like having to skim through things to keep it tight and concise so that I can keep it within a you know two to three hour limit is good. I need somebody to keep me focused on that. But it does mean that you know I do have some stuff left over, as it were. And um, me and Scott were talking about this and talking about like how I feel about having to leave stuff out and Scott pointed out I could just use clips from the streams and then expand upon them myself so that way you know I, I can um, I could add my notes so the work doesn't go to waste and um, I can have stuff that's not DSP related for the channel and I can go into more psychological topics as well um, which is you know a pretty good point so yeah I'm going to try that now um, what are the particular uh, cases that I thought would be a good um a good starting point was um, the case of the Papin sisters, or Papin sisters. Um, I am going to butcher th French throughout this, so apologies in advance. Je suis désolé. And um, I feel like I should add a trigger warning as well, because um, there's nothing particularly graphic in this. I'm, you know, we're not going to show any graphic photos or anything, but uh, there will be descriptions of a particularly violent murder. So... Yeah, you might not want to. Um, you might want to skip this one if that's not your sort of thing. But you know, if if you are into true crime and um, psychology and that sort of thing, I think this one might be of of interest. So um, yeah, let's go to the stream first, which was about women who kill. Uh, following a stream we did about serial killers, we sort of point we we discussed for a bit that there are more men than women, so we thought women who kill would be a good sort of. You know, subject to look at. So I got quite a few examples, and we managed to get a few streams out of that because, again, I, I did, you know, took a lot of notes and things and thought, you know, this is work here. I want to get some use out of it. So, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to do that further now. <laughs> Thanks for um, enabling my exploitation of you, Scott. So are yeah. you looking for Christine and Leah Papin, P-A-P-I-N. These are two French women, and I am going to butcher French throughout this, so I apologise in advance. Papin. But I don't want to do your stereotypical Christine and Leah Papin. Christine, yeah. Christine and Leah Papin. Leah Papin, yeah. So could I say immediately as well, what I see about these two is that they've got these much better fashion sense than that previous lady. They've got a lovely haircuts, mm. like, you know... These two worked as living maids around France, so they would have to you know, dress a certain way. They were they were serving uh, people who were like higher socially than them. They were serving, um, you know, well, basically for anybody who needed a maid, they would they would work around the Le Mans area, and they they were noted as being quite good maids, to be fair. But they typically preferred to work as a, like to work with each other. So if if a place hired one but not the other, the one wouldn't stay. If a place hired Christine. Like and wouldn't hire Leia, Christine would leave. So they 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 tried to stick together because they'd grown up. Um, when they actually let's just go to their birth first. So yeah, Christine was born first. She was the older of the two, but she's the middle of three children. They actually have a, an older sister, but she's not involved in this in any way. She um, Christine's born in 1905, and Leah is born in 1911. 
So we're talking at a time when France is going through a lot of like social and political turmoil. So the first interruption of the stream and it's for a little segment that I like to call cultural context. Need to set the scene a little here. The area where Christine and Leia grew up had a bit of a um, a backwards rural sort of reputation. You know, like um, I don't want to offend anyone from like Alabama, but you know, that sort of area. Um, like how the English view the Welsh, I guess. Um, this one's for my mate Nige. If you're from New Mills, for example. Um so, um, along with all the scurrilous rumours that, that come with that sort of place. Um, common view of the lower orders was not great as well in Paris at the, um, at the, at the time. Obviously, it had been a while since the French Revolution, but um, the activities of, of, of and behaviour of the mob um, that had run Paris at the time were still somewhat fresh of a scar on the national psyche. So, um, yeah... Uh, France was definitely a society that was stratified by class at the time and, you know, well, probably still is actually most places. Uh, um, there's usually a, a form of underclass. Um, but that's sociology and, you know, that's for another video. Um, the point is that people uh, from the places where Christine and Leah grew up were not really seen that favourably at the time. Now, at the time of the murders, France is experiencing a, a period of political and social turmoil. Uh, following World War One and the Great Depression, uh, France has been struggling to recover. It's done fairly well, but quite slowly. Um, so there's a weakened party of like coalition from different parties, and they're struggling to govern. They don't really have like a, a, a sort of like central figurehead or leader. Uh, meanwhile, there's a, a lot of immigration from uh, different parts of the uh, French Empire. So people from the colonies are coming to France. Uh, there's growing right wing sentiment because of the, um, the, the, the you know the increased immigration and the uh, the the impact of the great depression in the recovery um your working class is becoming increasingly unionized and the country is sort of like overall following this this trend of less religiosity they're becoming less religious people are still going to church for like major occasions but not as weekly you know things on a sunday that you do um Paris, on the other hand, has become like this major cultural hotbed as, as all these like expatriate writers and artists and thinkers and musicians are coming over because, you know, Paris is now the place to be. Um, there's an increase, there's an explosion in the popularity of jazz as well because black Americans are bringing New York, New York, New Orleans style jazz um, to uh, black communities in, in Paris. So um, jazz really takes off there and overall, Paris is sort of like going through a cultural renaissance, but the rest of France is still sort of struggling with things and um, class is still very much um, a, a social strata. You know, there, there, there's still a sort of like a lingering mistrust of the underclass, the lower classes, people like Christine and Leia, um, especially in like a, a nicer upper class sort of area like Le Mans. So, yeah, there's there's a lot of turmoil going on at the time. And so a lot of writers are, and are subsequently, you know, enraptured by this case. But anyway, there's there's cultural context for the time period that we're in. So when Christine's born, she's sent to live with her paternal aunt and uncle and she lives with them for seven years. And Leah's born in 1911 and is sent to live with her maternal uncle and she lives with him until he dies. And then the two join their elder sister, Emilia, in an orphanage until they're about 15. Now, Amelia, at this point, sort of separates. She goes and joins a convent in 1918. And as far as anybody knows, that's where she lived like the remainder of her life. She, she was not involved in what happened next. Okay, so a few more points about the sisters' early lives. Um, accounts seem to differ about their father, Gustav. He's either described as quite amiable and accommodating, or he's an abusive alcoholic. Um, most accounts have Clemence claiming that he sexually assaulted Amelia when Amelia was nine. And that's why um, that, that led her to divorce him. And so uh, Amelia and Christine were sent to an orphanage. At the time, Leah was only two years old, so she was sent to live with an uncle instead. But Amelia and Christine, they ended up at an orphanage. Um, Clemence, meanwhile, her, her sort of like portrayal is fairly consistent. She's usually described as aloof and cold. She's not really, you know, there for the... The, her daughters she doesn't really seem to care much about them and um she's repeatedly involved in extramarital affairs so she's you know 
there are lingering resentments from the girls to their mother. Later on, after Amelia joins the convent, Christine says that she also wants to join, but Clemence forbids her from doing so and instead finds a placement as a maid. And from that point on, things really start to sour between Christine and Clemence, and it culminates in her and Leah having an argument over money with her in 1929, and after that point, they, they completely cut contact with her. Um, she tries to maintain contact. She writes them letters, but they, they either don't get them or they don't reply. But either way, after 1929, the girls cut contact with their mother. So um, in 1926, the sisters become maids for the Lancelot family. And, Lancelot. Uh, Lancelot. Lancelot. Yeah, these cons- Lancelot. These consist of René Lancelot. René Lancelot. So I think that's how it's pronounced. And Jean Nervive. Jean Nervive. Jean Nervive Lancelot. Oh, the talent. You are coming for the little kisses now, Jean Nervive. Oh, I am no. having you. I am bringing you in for the little kisses. Jean- oh, Jean Nervive. Oh, sorry. I think that's how it's pronounced. I think that's how it's pronounced. Yeah, something like that. No. It's a good, 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 good attempt at the accent. Um, <laughs> So yeah, uh, Rene, the, the 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 father, the husband, is a retired solicitor, so he's quite well off. Uh, Madame Leone and Genevieve are quite, you know, quite well respected, quite well educated. They're very in in French society. They're quite well off, so they're quite high up. And the girls initially do very very well, but after a couple of years, Madame Leone develops m- mental health issues. And she starts becoming uh, physically aggressive and abusive towards the, the sisters. Like she would, she would hit them quite frequently, and she would abuse them. She would like be overly critical of like the cleaning that they were doing or the cooking that they were doing or whatever. Mm. So if they failed so, to live up to the exacting standards. Time out for a second. Number one, did I just do a racism there? Did I do a racism by doing a French accent? No, no. Uh, a minor correction here. I couldn't actually find that much about. Uh, Leone's mental health at the time and as a result I don't feel confident saying like it's the cause of a shift uh, in the relationship between the sisters and the family. Um, Renee claims that the sisters changed following the argument that they had with their mother in 1929 whereas many other articles and sources claiming that the family didn't really talk to the sisters at all some claiming for like the entire time they were there. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that because at the start, Christine convinces them to also take Leia. So they must like have some sort of relationship for them to trust her when she says, my sister's also pretty good at, you know, the maid thing. So, you know, I have the fear, but also Renee is obviously going to try and put like as positive a spin on the relationship between his family and the sisters as he can to make it look like they're not like particularly cold hearted people. But I mean, you know, either way it's difficult to find much on like Leone's health during her life um, and especially her mental health so I feel like I should at least correct this point and sort of bring up this minor sort of tangent. Now uh, according to most accounts the relationships between the sisters and Leone Lancelon um, and, and the Lancelons in general really um, would likely have been cold in business like you know there's very little conversation and, and mainly you know simple orders rather than actual chatter hey how are you doing today how are you feeling what's you know what's the latest with this and that actual concern and empathy you know we can infer this partly because of the testimony of René Lancelot following the murders who said that um, after the 1929 argument with their mother uh, the girls became gloomy and taciturn and that since then neither my wife nor I had any conversation with them outside of work and we also know that this would not have been unusual at the time um, socially and culturally, the distance between the, the sisters and the Lancelons would have been vast. So they were unlikely to have socialised recreationally. The sisters were from a poor area. They were maids. They occupied a lowly role in society, whereas the Lancelons had done very well for themselves. You know, he was um, a very respected person in society and they were doing quite well. So they were seen as, you know, favourable and higher. And, you know, you know, you know, social stratification works the sisters also worked uh 12 to 14 hours a day for six and a half days a week they had uh, half of sunday off i think because they talk about going to the church um but that's it they, they didn't really have like any more outside recreational activities or any other socializing um most of their lives would have been taken up by work um Leonie Lancelot would routinely wear white gloves and she'd be you know sweeping her finger across things to check how dusted they've been 
She'd send notes to the kitchen, uh, criticizing Christine's cooking, and she once pinched Leia so hard that she bled because Leia was slow to pick up a piece of paper that she dropped. So their relationship would likely not have been great. Um, though, again, for the time, socially and culturally, probably acceptable to be, you know, a bit of a prick to your staff. Um, yeah. It's pretty sad, that, isn't it? One night, the, um, Madame Leone comes home and she finds there's no lights on in the house. And she asks why. And the sisters explained that um, Christine had plugged in a light, a, a, an iron and it had a faulty fuse and it had tripped the circuit in the house. Because obviously, 1930s, wiring's a bit iffy. And at this, Madame Leone loses it and she starts assaulting the sisters on the... Um, on the, the the landing of the first floor and the sisters start fighting back christine fucking loses it starts fighting back and then Le leah gets involved she starts fighting and then genevieve gets involved and she's trying to like fight these off her mom and um, the sisters overpower leonie and genevieve and the next thing that's found out is when um monsieur lancelon Rene, the husband, he, he comes back because he's expected to meet his wife and his daughter at an, at an event, and they're not there. So he comes back home, finds the door locked. The lights are off apart from one light in the sister's room. So he gets like um, a local police officer to come and help him get in, because he can't get through the door. And when they get in, they find the bodies of Mademoiselle Genovieve and Madame Leonie on the landing. They find an eyeball on the stairs. On the wait, 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 wait. Time out. Yeah. Time out. So, so um, we're not uh, bam, bam. He's, he's there. He's there, like. Genevieve! Genevieve! Ouvre la porte! Genevieve! Genevieve! Ouvre la porte! This is a long time ago, right? So don't don't think don't get eggy about me, like you know, doing my little drama of the. Did you, that was that murdered. something you remembered from school? Because I can barely remember any French from school now. Parlez-vous français? Ouvre la porte. Oh, oh, he's going to open the door. I, yeah, yeah just, I remember what they taught me yeah, a bit. So wait, wait, we've got this man, right? Genevieve, Genevieve, ouvre la porte, and then like eventually. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, I'm going to have to try and say how yes, to get the police. Officer. La police. Um, Avec, <laughs> le police. avec moi, uh, dans le gendarme, maison, gendarme, Monsieur they? Police, pour favor. Yeah. And then he gets them and they leave the door open. They're in. And there's an eyeball yeah. on the stairs. Yeah. Yeah. So they go upstairs and the bodies of um, Leonie and. Oh no, Leonie! Oh, moi, Leonie! The eyeball, the eyeball turns out to be Genevieve's. The other one is found under her. Whereas Mademoiselle Leonie's eyeballs are found in her scarf around her neck. What? Uh, they have both been bludgeoned and stabbed beyond like recognition. And the door to the, the sister's room is locked. So, you know, was it, whatever it was you said. <laughs> Uber I did, better, I did better at German. Um, so <laughs> they open the door and they find the sisters like huddled together in bed. And there's the... Um, a bloody hammer and a knife, like on the on the what these two the table. are in bed. These two, not in bed, in bed, but I mean, like they're sat in bed together, like because they know this is it. They're like fully aware of what's about to happen next. Oh right, so, I, 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 oh, God, like I thought they got had each other. Decide to go for sleeps. Okay, so some further expansion on the escalation of the fight. Uh, according to Christine's testimony, uh, when Leone lunged at her, she lunged at Genevieve, while Leia leapt at Leone. Uh, both sisters then gouged their victim's eyes out. Christine says she then ran to the kitchen to get more weapons, uh, returning with a hammer and a kitchen knife. And uh, with those weapons, the sisters set about stabbing and bludgeoning the uh, the Lancelons. Um, they swapped weapons several times and at one point even grabbed a nearby pewter jug to use as a weapon as well. Um, they also slashed uh, at the legs of the, uh, the, the Lancelons as well as you know, um, stabbing and bludgeoning the, the faces and the heads. I also have to address this now. Uh, some of your more salacious accounts tend to... Um, they'll, they'll claim that the sisters smeared menstrual blood, either their own or Genevieve's, on Leone's body. Um, the reality is simply that 
Genevieve was on her period at the time and her menstrual blood mixed with all the other blood she was losing that was, you know, not necessarily deliberately being smeared, but is just in the madness of a frenzied attack is, is probably going everywhere. So, um, yeah, it, it's not mentioned in every account, but it is in a few, and I feel like, you know, that's definitely a thing you want to clear up. I mean, not literally, but well, actually literally as well, yeah. But <laughs> Christine is also often quoted as saying, I- I'm going to massacre them at the start of the attack. But um, I couldn't find out whether she actually said it or if she said to have said it. So it, it's one of those things that may possibly be apocryphal, but it may also be that she did say it. I couldn't find out either way. But again, it's something that gets mentioned in a lot of retelling, so it's something that I thought I should also expand upon here. They immediately confess to what they've done. They say, you know, got out of hand, she started battering us, (laughs) self-defence. Yeah. Not going to play the old, uh, you know, oh, I don't know. (laughs) Someone come in and did it. Like, Jesus Christ. I mean, it sounds like this is one where it just kicked right off, doesn't it? Like, did they, they must have lost their, like, they were already being the, the subject of violence in the first place and people had started kicking it's off and they just decided to... Alan, the detective in Paul's attic sent tippies. Thank you, but I'm not, we're not going on about that chuffer today. The um, the, the ladies They were, here, yes, rollbacks. They were naked, by the way. What? So the the dead people naked. or these people? Them, them two. The sisters, these two were naked. This is a trigger warning as I'm about to discuss the rumours of a possible incestuous relationship between the sisters. If this might upset you, please skip to 25 minutes, 49 seconds. So we now need to talk about these incest rumours. Um, told you this one would be difficult. This is another one of those areas where your more sensationalist retellings of things tend to embellish the truth a little. So we need to dispel a few rumours here. First things first, the sisters were not found naked in bed they were actually wearing nightgowns and um secondly they were only in bed together because they only had the one bed their you know their their living accommodations were cramped tiny they were in the attic on the third floor they had to share a bed you know they, they didn't have much room um a servant's life was not glamorous or easy it was shit they, they were huddled together in their in in the bed that they had to share <laughs> so yeah, but unfortunately from that springs many um, many salacious rumours about um, incestuous relationship between the two. After being kept apart before the trial, the sisters were briefly reunited in jail, at which point Christine is reported to have removed her blouse and cried out, tell me yes, tell me yes, uh, to Leia. Though obviously she did it in French, which is... Dis ma we. Oui. I'm gonna get Scott to say it. Dis ma we. Oui. Uh, some accounts embellish this incident further by claiming that Christine also exposed her breasts and pleasured herself. But again, there is like no contemporary evidence for this. The earliest mention of any sort of incestuous relationship between the two appears to come from um, one Doctor Logre a mental health specialist who had been called in by the defence. Um, after the trial, he gave an interview to a true crime magazine called Allo Belief, uh, in which he stated that the Papan sisters gave every appearance of having an abnormal relationship, that of lovers. And uh, to support this, he cited their lack of social and romantic lives uh, as evidence, and as well as likening the uh, despair that Christine felt while she was in prison um, during her separation from Leah to that of a lover forcibly removed from his beloved mistress. So um, he's automatically sort of seen that that, uh, imbalance of power and seen like Christine in the masculine role and seen Leia as in the uh, the feminine role. So he's already placing Christine as like, you know, in in the more dominant uh, position, um, both socially and culturally. Um, His point, however, is not to imply that the sisters were having an incestuous relationship, but that the courts should not consider uh, both Christine and Leia as like equally responsible in the murders because there's a massive power imbalance between the two. Um, and you can see this conclusion sort of supported by things like how Christine reacted 
uh, to the separation compared to Leia, who did much better than Christine, who, you know, at one point tried to gouge her own eyes out and had to be placed in a straitjacket. Um, there's also how the sisters acted in police interviews. Leia was very quiet and reticent, whereas Christine was quite forthcoming and accepting of, you know, the responsibility of what they'd done. Um, and obviously how the court sentenced them differently. So that was the uh, initial point about the um, imbalance of power between the sisters' relationship being twisted into um, sort of rumours about incestuous relationship between the two because the uh, the comparison had been made to a uh, a romantic relationship in, uh, in to make a point of this power balance between the two rather than I think these two are you know actually sleeping with each other. But again, your more sensationalist retellings of things tend to to run with that angle instead. I think I feel for them a little bit because, like you know, the violence has come to them. They've kicked off big style, and sometimes if like you're kicking off, like if there's two of you and you're both kicking off, I can imagine it's gone too far. Uh, yeah. And then like Plus you are in your sort of like mid twenties. I think Christine's a little like later twenties and uh, Leah's early twenties. But you, you know, a much older woman and a much younger girl, they've probably got the advantage. So, yeah, you know, they're probably a bit stronger, especially Leah as a uh, not Leah. Uh, Christine was known, you know, she's the taller one. She was the one who did more of the um, like sort of manual labor, even though she was also a pretty good cook. She would usually do like you know. The hoovering, the ironing, all that stuff. So, lifting um, the woman up the stairs, get her on her back, putting her in the bath, getting her out of the bath, lifting her into her bed. She's not. You know, I just, I'm paying you. I might as well have you carry her around the house. You know, carrying her around in the streets on her back, going down the market, fetch me two pounds of potatoes. I want you to carry them on your back as well. It's part of the deal. I, you know. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. So. They oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. To... Um, Dues pondre de patati. <laughs> sorry. Carry on. I'm sure it was pomme de terre, wasn't it? Pomme de terre, apples of the earth. Uh, Dues, I don't know, pounds either. They do kilos, don't they? Do kilo de pomme de terre. All right, forget it. Look, it's not a French lesson. Um, these two are bludgeoning these people to death. Thanks, what? <laughs> yeah. They're bad chuffers. They're so, in bed uh, naked. I don't know why they're naked either. They've got the hammer. Does it all kick off again or do they just come quietly? No, no, they come quietly. They come quietly. But mm. the thing is that from that point on, the, their mental state becomes a serious issue around this case. This case grips France because obviously you've got the worker, the working class, like violently murdering their rich overlords. Mm. And so the political climate at France at the time meant that inspired like a lot of people to, you know, play, they would write plays about it, they'd write like philosophical essays about what it all so meant. It, it became a very big crime at the time. Because they France. have got a little bit of a history of doing that, haven't they? No. Like, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Peasants sort of killing their, their rulers. Yeah. Particularly French thing. We've 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 dabbled before, let's to be to be fair. But um yeah. The French have it done quite well. So yeah, yeah. Well, there's a word for that. The there's, there's like um, matricide for killing your mother, patricide for killing like regicide for yeah. killing the king. Filicide for if you really don't know that guy in Renton. Phil <laughs> aside, I see what you yeah. did there, wasn't yeah. yeah. Um, oh god, Jay Condor, well done. <laughs> You have to read it out if you're going to say it. I, I can't find it. You have to say. Got it. a new job at the guillotine factory. I'll be heading there shortly. <laughs> you can have a button for that. You can have a button for that. What button do you want? Hang on. You can have this one. Good button. I can't yeah. believe it. I just don't believe it. <laughs> there you go. You've had you've had Gilbert Godfrey there. Well done. Um, yeah. So yeah, the, the the crime becomes quite a big thing and so a lot of attention is focused on like their mental state at the time and um oh sorry, 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 sorry time out i know i know i'm doing a lot of time, i'm doing a lot of interruption but i can't not do this one then. yeah pam says they don't look like women in the eyes yeah but pam they do up the i can't <laughs> believe it i just don't believe it <laughs> so sorry <laughs> they're definitely women they were found naked yeah definitely women yeah. Mm -hmm. Carry carry on then, sorry. Um, so they're separated during the trial and Christine finds this really, really difficult to deal with. Because mm -hmm. um, she's the older one. She's the, the the more dominant of the two. Leah is quite like withdrawn. She's quite quiet, whereas Christine is like quite outgoing and quite, you know, she's strong, she'll speak her mind. So when the sisters are separated, Christine starts to really struggle to cope with it. And um, during the trial... The 
their lawyer pleads not guilty by reason of insanity, but they're like they're assessed by court appointed doctors who find them saying they're fit to stand trial. They knew what they did at the time and all that stuff. But during the trial, it comes out that hey, there's a men there's a history of mental illness in their family. During the trial, uh, much was made about the sisters' family history of mental health and uh, mental illness. They have several extended family members, like like cousins, I think, um, who who died in asylums or committed suicide. Uh, their paternal grandfather also had violent outbursts, and they also had an uncle who suffered from epileptic fits. So at the time, um, you know, these these would have been significant things to bring up to the the, the courts. And now for a segment I like to call more cultural context. Um, this time we're going to be talking about the state of psychology at the time, because obviously any sort of psychological assessment that's done of the sisters is done with the hindsight of like 90 years of research and development. So we have to consider what psychology was like at the time and what current psychological thinking was. So in the field of psychology, <laughs> I don't like the way I say that. So at the time, behaviorism had started to arise in response to the unscientific and untestable claims of what's known collectively as depth psychology. You know, um, it, it, the, the bits that explored the uh, relationship between the conscious and the unconscious. So, you know, people like Freud and Jung and Adler, um, those were sort of, you know, dominating most psychological thinking at the turn of the century and as a re response to that the idea that um, humans are animals and could be trained to uh, respond to certain things it started happening um, B.F. Skinner had yet to build a box with a rat in it but Watson had traumatised little Albert and Pavlov had noticed that his dogs w would start salivating once they heard a bell and that's a discovery that I could take advantage of all these decades later by simply saying walkies and seeing how many comments I get from annoyed dog owners. Meanwhile, Jung and Adler had split from Freud and they'd begun to publish their own analytical theories. But Freud's still on a bit of a tear after publishing a bunch of essays and papers on sexuality, childhood development and the ego and the id. So psychoanalytic theory was still quite... Um, it's so hot right now. So yeah, any sort of like psychological um, examination of the sisters should be considered in that context. Um, just because we now know differently nearly a century later doesn't mean that we should, you know, discard or, or, or in any way demean or ridicule uh, the conclusions drawn by people who were in a world that didn't, that hadn't yet discovered operant conditioning. So we are quite early on in terms of like how psychology has developed as a field so they, they 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 did what they could with what they had at the time but there are some accounts that claim that uh in the months leading up to the murders christine had begun to experience uh auditory and visual hallucinations um the implication there is that she's now what we'd consider paranoid schizophrenic uh leia meanwhile has been said to be prone to panic attacks and anxiety um, and the symptoms that both sisters were experiencing have been starting to worsen following, you know, the argument with their mum and their increasing social isolation and their lack of uh, recreational activities outside of working for the lawn salons. I couldn't quite fully verify these claims, but I have seen them mentioned a few times. So I thought they might be worth considering here, but I don't necessarily know if I agree with them or not. It's eventually concluded that the sisters suffer from a case of what's known as folie à deux, or shared paranoid disorder, which happens when you have a, a pair or a, short, a small group of people who are really close together. So it's usually family, you know, sometimes friends, but it's usually family. And what will happen is one of them will become paranoid and through like the way they control and relate to the other relative or sibling, they too will become paranoid. So you can have cases where like, like an older brother or an older sister will become the more dominant one and will be able to influence you that, hey, no, this thing that we're doing is right. This is for our own good, all this sort of stuff. Mm. You can convince somebody to act like in a way that they wouldn't ordinarily because you're both sharing this, this like shared delusion of paranoia. And you can also imagine that in a situation where they've got each other, but the rest of the household is sort of, not against them, but you know, they're on a different team yeah. in a way. And so they're always like, you know, seeing it through their eyes and feeling that they're on their own little team against the world, yeah. So yeah, let's talk about folly idea. It's a rare condition in which delusions of paranoia are shared between two or more individuals. Um, it, typically in this dynamic, you will have one person who is dominant. They are usually called the primary or the inducer. And uh, the other person or people around them are 
you know, you're more meek and submissive individuals. Um, they're typically called the secondary or the acceptor. There's, there's a couple of other terms, but those are you know the ones that I, I found the most. It's considered a shared psychotic disorder, but it's not listed in the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, as a separate entity, but it is considered a delusional disorder and is listed in the section on psychotic disorders. Uh, couples, siblings, and parent-child pairs make up 90% of the cases, and uh, in two thirds of cases, the, the the people involved are socially isolated. Um, interestingly, the main uh, the the majority of your secondary partners uh, meet the criteria for dependent personality disorder, which is typically characterised by fear and the need of constant reassurance and support. Uh, there are four subtypes of folly idea, which I'm going to move out of the way slightly and let editor Steve list here because you know, the, as you can see, there's some French words in there and I can't be bothered to try and <sighs> that's the benefit that I have now. <laughs> I can, I can decide to do this and editor Steve has to work with the footage that he's got. Good luck working with this footage, editor Steve. You're going to need it. Oh, I should feel an ending. Fuck. As it's such a rare condition, little's known about the exact etiology of folie adieu, though there are a couple of factors that are thought to influence development, which include uh, increasing social isolation, obviously, um, environmental factors such as living in a hostile environment, both in terms of uh, the, the home, your domestic situation, and a wider societal position, uh, perspective, um, language difficulties and other problems communicating and the nature of the relationship between primary and secondary individuals. That's really interesting. Hello, Freudian slip. Don't worry about being late. Yeah. Brawl, uh, the brawl box madness on the M6. There was a case of these two, I think they were Swedish twins who, um, yes, thank you, the Swedish twins. They had a similar case of folly idea and it was caught on camera because they were caught near a motorway and one of them suddenly decided to run out into the traffic. And I think she made it to the median and then the other one tried to run out in traffic and got hit and then the first one ran back and got i, I don't remember the sequence but there was a, a similar case okay so a brief note about what's known as the swedish twins case uh, in may 2008 ursula and sabina ericsson uh, twins from sweden who've been on holiday in the uk um they became a notable example of folly adieu because both were spotted on the central reservation of the m6 motorway uh, officers were called to assist the women, but instead both Sabina and Ursula ran across the motorway instead. Uh, Ursula did manage to dodge the traffic, but Sabina was knocked over. And at that point, the police arrived and the twins ran back into the traffic. And this time both were hit by oncoming vehicles. Uh, when Sabina regained consciousness, she refused medical aid and she instead tried to attack the police, after which she was sedated and arrested. She was released from custody soon after and was taken in by a man named Glenn Hollingshead, who she stabbed to death the next day before jumping from a bridge onto a busy road. Um, she survived that fall. I think she broke her ankles and her head. Um, she fractured her skull, not broke her head. You know she, you know what I mean. Um, after being arrested, she pled guilty to manslaughter um, with diminished responsibility and cited folly idea and uh, experiencing auditory hallucinations. Uh, she was sentenced to five years and was released on parole in 2011 and she returned to Sweden while Ursula recovered in hospital and then moved to America. So that's one other notable case of um, folly idea. There's a couple of other uh, case studies and things that I found um, that I'll link in the description below, some other folly idea cases. But yeah, that's the, the, the Swedish twins case. They're both found guilty, but because it's seen that Christine is the far more dominant one than Leia, Christine gets sentenced to death. She gets sentenced to be beheaded, but it is later commuted to life imprisonment, whereas mm. Leia only gets 10 years. Wow. During um, the state. Time out. We're going Stop. to talk about their, their, their sentences and that, and this follow do a thing. Uh, Steve, we had a question in chat that I wanted to make sure we picked up on. How was the eye mm. removed? <laughs> <laughs> um. They, they were gouged out by the, oh. the sisters oh. with their thumbs. Oh. It was it was not like how they um how they subdued uh, Madame Leonie and Mademoiselle Genevieve. The, 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 like the sisters would go for the eyes, you know, to, to get someone down quickly. So yeah. Wow. And uh, then 
Like, they Christine went and got a hammer and a knife and then... Yeah, yeah time out, right? We're going to talk about the fact they got convicted, they're in this psychosis and then they go, go to prison, right? But, um, like... <sighs> this question came up earlier. Meth Bear asked it about, you know, fighting women and, you know, the strength and the balance. I wonder, like, sometimes... I'm, I'm talking in generality, so let's not get spinned off on YouTube, but, like, in a fight situation, like, if you're giving someone some shit and then they suddenly, like, attack you and, like, go for your eyes, like, I wonder, you know, I don't know if it's about hulking great strength in some situations as to um surprise and uh situation and stuff like that i mean it's it's pretty <laughs> keon says thumbs up from me <laughs> 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 how distasteful it says don't be but she's joking yeah um, but like it, it seems to me that that was a like you know an act of um shocking brutality that would escalate things to a situation where the average person wouldn't be in a position to react. Like you wouldn't, most of us have not practiced how to react to that sort of level of shock and brutality. Mm -hmm. So like once it's happening, it's happening. And then I think, uh, yeah, like it, it's pretty, pretty extreme that was. So uh, they've gone, the, they've been obviously convicted and you said that they mm -hmm. had this mental issue. Was that, did that mental issue reduce their sentence? Was it taken into consideration? <clears throat> or? It reduced Leah's sentence, definitely. She only got 10 years because she was seen as, like, the sort of subservient one. Like, that she would be the one that, like, Christine would say, do this thing, and she'd go and do it. So it was seen as, like, in her defense, she was... And this was born out in court as well because of the way that, like, Christine acted compared to Leah. Christine was obviously mm. the more outspoken one, and Leah was very quiet. And, you know, Christine would look you in the eye, whereas Leah would avert her gaze. And so these were seen as signs that... Christine's the more dominant one, Leah's the more subservient one. And it's sort of borne out by what happens to them after conviction because during her prison sentence, Christine found it really, really difficult to be away from Leah. There was an incident where they were brought together briefly and she threw herself at Leah and like ripped her dress open and went, please come back. Yes, please, please, you know. And they weren't allowed to be kept together. She wrote letters. She wrote so many letters asking to be kept in the same prison as Leah, but they never let her. Civil play. And after a while. Civil play. <laughs> but after a while, um, she she started she she started suffering like serious mental health problems again. She started to have periods of fits and psychosis. She had suffered from depression and then she stopped eating. She refused oh. food. And she eventually sorry for starved her. herself to death. Hmm? I feel sorry for her. Like, I feel like sad yeah. for her, but like she did a murder. She's like done a murder. She did but, a murder. Like she was in a difficult She's situation a and oh. she reacted really badly, but uh yeah, I kind of feel sorry for her in a way, yeah. So, yeah, she ended up starving herself to death in prison. And she uh, she died in 19... They were sent to prison in... When was it? 1933? And she died in 1937. Whereas Leah served eight years in prison. She was released early for good behavior. And then she <laughs> wait, wait, wait! Time out, time out. How do you how how can you behave so well in prison that you get released after you like done that? Like, oh well, you know. Well, I, I do like the way she sweeps up. <laughs> yeah, but like, you're only serving ten you years. At least, oh, man. I mean, I mean, this is the past, isn't it? So things are different now, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But imagine going to prison yeah. for like a horrific murder like that. You got you know psychological issues which i suppose for me would mean like maybe you should be treated as well um but yeah after a few years you're good at the sweeping up you behave yourself so why don't we let you out I'm like wow yeah sorry yeah, I mean, well, you, people go down for worse for less nowadays and you, you know if you plead guilty here at least you get like an immediate 25 percent off your time, <laughs> discount <so. laughs> special yeah. offer broken britain 25 percent off your sentence <laughs> in prison <laughs> That's value for money, that, mate. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> for us, the taxpayers yeah, so, are not, but no, yeah, continue. <laughs> yeah. So Leia, Leia serves for eight years and she gets out early. She changes her name and she moves out of the area. And she finds work as a hotel maid for a while. And then she sort of slips out of most of like recorded history until oh, around right. 1982 when people start saying, oh, she died. She died. But in the year 2000, French filmmaker is making a film called Enquête des Sous Papel. Enquête des Sous Sisters. Des Sous, I think. Des Sous, sorry, I was just. I, I told you, I'm going to butcher it because I've not even <laughs> I've not captured like accents as I'm writing. Enquête des Sous Papel. Enquête. Enquête. Enquête des Sous Papel. In search of the Papel sisters, and he claims right. to have discovered Leia living in a hospice in the year oh. 2000. 
she suffered a stroke and wasn't able to speak. Mm. And this woman died in 2001. So if that was actually her, she lived until 2001. And that's that's where it ends. The, the, the sisters are buried together in, in the same cemetery. So. Wow, I, I don't think this is bordering on one it's of these. It's an unknown where, one, but I, I tell you what, it's bordering on one of these where it could have um, some sort of cult status in a way. You know, from the goths mm-hmm. and stuff like that. They seem like almost uh, anti-heroes in some way that they stood up to them. They're almost tragic, aren't they? It's tragic yeah. heroin sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, they stood up to the people who were abusing them, but maybe took it too far. A bit like Bonnie and Clyde in a way, but like they didn't go out together, did they? In that, like they had that. No. Um, that that sadness that of that final full separation, shootout yeah. sort of thing, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to say uh, seven out of ten, obviously. Oh, thank you. <laughs> seven out of ten for the the French sisters. Um, you know, interesting, interesting. Like I, I'm joking, of course. I rate everything seven out of ten. So, I'd, um, and I don't need to rate these. They're just murder women that don't a murder. Um, are you coming in, Kat? Are you coming in? Yeah, you and your back. Right, that's going to get yeah, fixed. Yeah, I mean, Lucy, uh, you imagine no if you got um. If you were working for a particularly harsh master, you probably didn't have many rights, and so you probably did get a couple of beatings. But yeah, no, I felt really sorry for these two, and I don't. There was just something about them that made me like when I first read about them. I thought that's pretty tragic, you know, especially when you see like like how badly it affected Christine. There was obviously some great like sisterly bond there. So yeah, but imagine like like carrying that till two thousand and one, the 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 change you would see in the world from like you know first world war france to 2001 mm. so I so pretty. i've got a question for chat as well right we were considering finishing up with these two <laughs> like big chuffers you know myra hindley i suppose we yeah, should yeah, talk yeah. about her today and rose west but what i don't want to do i suppose if it's coming towards like the final few is i think i think it's actually a really interesting vibe that we're conjuring because these people that from the past are so far distant in the past that we can talk about it mm. uh and reflect on it and maybe even you know joke about it a little bit or whatever Um, but it doesn't feel quite as raw and it's also like interesting stories from the past in a way isn't it so yeah that was the case of christine and leah papan um as i mentioned i don't know actually did i mention i might cut it out i don't know what editor steve will leave in like when i first read about them i thought that's pretty tragic so just in case to cover my ass in both cases uh i i first found this case in a book about like murders of passion um, not passion romance, but passion as in, you know, um, heat of the moment I saw red and shot him, you know, that sort of passion. And um, it stuck with me for a number of reasons. There's, you know, the, the sort of like repressed ferocity of it, the, that this tension had been building for a while and then it just sort of like explodes out in this unrestrained orgy of violence. Um, obviously, there's like, you know, a, a political aspect of it as well. Where you have these 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 girls from like an underprivileged background and 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 you know seen as less in society, um, and they're sort of like lashing out at their social superiors. Um, but there's also uh, like like a tragedy to the psychology of it all, where you, you know you have this sort of like very timid and quiet, um, withdrawn layer who I really felt for because you know I, I've been in that position where I'm the sort of quiet timid person who's just supposed to keep their head down and doesn't want to cause a fuss you know and that's to deal with like anxiety and depression and things through my life so you know i sort of really like resonated with her and and sort of felt the, the psychology of being affected by somebody that you trust so much because they are all you've had in your life and you know this this whole incredibly rare psychological phenomena that at the time you could possibly have comprehended it's it's such a unique thing um so it's 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 a case that stuck with me um i did actually manage to find one of the letters from christine as well which again i'm going to move here so i did to steve as a bit of an easier time placing it on screen um if you could read french and decipher the handwriting feel free uh to hit pause i'm just going to move back this way um so yeah that was the case it stuck with me for a while uh it's it's always interested me and um, I, I felt like, you know, here, here's an opportunity to talk about it because, you know, not a lot of people know about it. So, you know, it, it made for an interesting stream and now I've been able to expand on it a bit more. And, you know, if people like this and it seems to do well, then I'll do it with other things because obviously there's other things that we talk about where I think I could have gone a bit longer for that. 
So, yeah, more psychology, more non-DSP stuff. <laughs> There'll still be DSP stuff, don't worry. Um, those those will still be coming. The uh, the, the six to twelve hour videos are, you know, they're not going anywhere. But this is you know something else for me to do. Uh, it, it's something else for me to build upon stuff I've already done elsewhere to use more of my resources and to you know make take advantage of more of the work that I've done. And you know it, it's a bit of variety for for everybody that subscribed to me. And, you know, if people like it, I'll do more because there's obviously more things that I want to pick out of the streams and expand upon. And, you know, thank you for watching, everybody. Thank you. Um, you know, these are not going to be multiple hours long, but, you know, something different, something new, a bit of a breather between the Lord of the Rings trilogy length psychological breakdowns of, of, of Phil's streams. I don't know how to say bye. <laughs>I assume that my you know relatives can watch this. I, they know that it exists, so I don't. Uh, but yeah, I don't kind of promote it to my friends. So I'll just say that. Um. <laughs>